Good morning, and welcome once again to our studies in the book of James. If you have your Bibles there, would you please turn to James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12 is what we're going to read. James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Let us read God's word together. James writes, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member. Yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring forth forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, be it olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond Yield fresh water. Amen. And we thank God for his word to us this morning. Let's just come together and seek God's blessing as we look at his word together. Father, we just thank you for your inerrant word. We thank you, Lord, for the book of James. And we thank you, Lord, for guiding and inspiring James to write what he's risen. We find it sometimes difficult to adhere to what is written in scripture, but we know, Lord, it is written for our good, and we know, the Lord, that by your help, your guidance, we can do and uphold these things you call us to do. So as we turn into the book of James this morning in chapter 3 about the tongue, we are very guilty, O Lord, of using our tongue in a willful, wicked way at times. And these words of James bring home the reality of our inadequateness our sinfulness, and how easily we fall into the trap of being too hasty to move our tongue and create words that are unbecoming, words that are hurtful, words that we should not use to attack people. Lord, we've sinned against you, so sinned against our brethren. Forgive our sins, we pray. Cleanse our mind, cleanse our lips, cleanse our hearts, we pray so that we may be truly pure in what we do, what we say, what we think. We know, Lord, that we will stumble, as James puts it again. But we know, Lord, we can come to you because you're willing to listen to us and forgive us when we come in the name of your Son. For your Son, O Lord, accomplished all things on the cross for our sakes, including our forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that in him, we are forgiven. But we also recognize we have a work to do in terms of discipling and calling others to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Give us willing hearts, O Lord, willing tongues, a willingness, O Lord, to declare there is but one Savior, one Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, O Father, that we would be making disciples, not sitting back and doing nothing. Enable us, O Lord, by grace to do more for the kingdom, even though there are so many restrictions upon us due to this pandemic. 
We know, Lord, there is going to be an ending of it. But, Lord, you know when that will be, and we don't. So keep us safe, keep us secure, encourage us. Let us not lose heart, for we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. One of the great blessings of doing something like this is that, well, it does take me out of my comfort zone, I have to say. It does encourage me to look at things. We'll come to that later in the series as to why I preach through books. But one of the things we've got to remember here is we are handling God's word. And we read it. But we also speak it. And we are creatures made in the image and likeness of God. And the tongue is a muscular organ. It's around three and a bit inches long, which enables us to taste, to chew, to swallow. It also enables us to make distinct sounds, like I'm making just now, sounds that you can understand. Without a tongue, we would only be able to make unintelligible grunts and sounds uh, 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 unable to communicate easily. Our tongue is vital to us in so many ways. But as James tells us, it's volatile, highly volatile. Of course, we're quick to avoid murder, stealing, drunkenness, but we have no compunction about assassinating fellow believers and leave destruction in our wake, no matter what. And how do we do that? By using our tongues. There is a familiar children's rhyme. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We know only too well that is not strictly true. Here's a different version by Ruby Redfort, who is a character in the children's book by Lauren Child. Listen to these words. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can also hurt me. Sticks and stones break only skin, but words are ghosts that haunt me. Slant and curved, the word swords fall. It pierces and sticks inside me. Bats and bricks may ache through bones, but words can mortify me. Pain from words has left its scar on mind and hair that's tender. Cuts and bruises have not healed. It's words that I remember. Words can very easily hurt people. And we need to learn to tame our tongues. But James acknowledges this is not an easy task. He writes in verses 7 8 For every kind of beast and bird and reptile, etc., etc., can be tamed, but no human being can tame the tongue. And then he goes on to say, It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. James earlier in his letter, addressed speech. In chapter 1, verse 19, he wrote, Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And then he goes on in 1 and 26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Now here in chapter 3, James addresses the tongue in detail. So this morning I want to look at these first two verses of chapter 3, and then next week I want to deal with verses 3 through to 12. So this morning, verses 1 and 2. Let's read these words again. James writes, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, 
able also to bridle his whole body. There's three things this morning. My first head is teachers of scripture. My second head is a warning. And the third, we all stumble. Firstly, the teachers of scripture. Teachers had a place of honor in biblical times. The top three offices of the New Testament in order of importance are apostles, prophets, and teachers. As a reformed church, we no longer have apostles and we no longer have prophets, but we do have teachers. The Jews placed a high value upon education, both secular and spiritually, as they still do today. The leader of a local Jewish community was a rabbi, and that title rabbi means great one. In New Testament times, it was taught a person's duty to the rabbi exceeded that of their duty to their parents. And the thrust of that premise being put is that parents bring children into the world, whereas the rabbi brings his people into the world to come. And so it was argued that if a person's parents and a rabbi were kidnapped, the rabbi should be ransomed first because his position is higher and hence more valuable. Today in the Presbyterian Church, we identify two distinct offices within leadership. Minister of Word and Sacrament, and elder. I, being a minister of word and sacrament, means I've been set apart by the church to lead in worship and officiate the two sacraments of the Reformed Church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Additionally, I am to preach and teach the word of God, the whole counsel of God, let it be said. Elders in the Presbyterian Church are ruling elders, and the minister is a teaching elder. My role, according to Paul in his letter to the church at Ephesus, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It is by preaching what the Bible has to say equips the body of Christ, thus encouraging growth to maturity. And that's why I preach through a book, and that's what we're doing here with James. Paul told the Ephesian elders, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. That is to say, he's saying, I couldn't allow myself to address my favorite issues, but I have to address what is before me. Here are five brief points why I preach through books of the Bible. Preaching through books of the Bible forces both preacher and congregation to deal with everything that the Bible has to say. Some passages of scripture are hard to understand and some hard to believe. That is a given. But that fact should not tempt a preacher to try and avoid or not touch them what at all. If I preach through a book at a time, then I have to come to difficult texts in some of them. Even if their meaning and application are difficult and uncomfortable for both congregation and myself. Secondly, preaching through books of the Bible keeps me away from going through to my hobby horse week in, week out. For if a congregation study a whole book at a time, then they get things in the balance and the proportion that God wanted it to be delivered. Preaching through a book allows the Holy Spirit, who encouraged the writing of Scripture, to set the agenda so that the preacher knows what he's going to preach Sunday by Sunday because he's already prepared and broken up the book, following generally mostly what it has to say, it has to be said in the translations. 
but is still broken up into segments to be studied week by week. And the preacher knows what he's going to go and investigate, prepare and write on week in, week out. And it should be understood that the role of a preacher is not that of a chef in getting all the ingredients together, but that of a waiter who simply serves the food that God has prepared for his people. And preaching through the books of the Bible develops a congregation to recognize the difference between right and wrong interpretations of scripture. When a congregation is used to hearing sound exposition of scripture, they become better equipped to study and apply the Bible in their own personal devotions. And fifthly, preaching through book, Bible books educates both preacher and congregation doctrinally. It is by expository preaching the scripture passage is exposed as God would have it exposed to us. Notice James doesn't say no one should teach or beware the teacher or not many should teach. Of course, I'd be glad to talk to anyone who thinks God may be calling them to ministry. But consider this question. Why is there a shortage of ministers in our denomination? Why is there a shortage of ministers in our denomination? I put it to you, the answer lies in the fact that we're not discipling. We're not exposing people to the truth that converts, which results in calling to ministry. I don't know what other churches people are from who are watching this. But ask yourselves, how many candidates has your church put forward for ministry in the last 20 years? I know what the answer is in the majority of cases, none. And the answer is, why is there a shortage of ministers in our denomination? Because truth is not being preached with conviction to convert and draw people unto God so that younger men and women will look and get a call to enter into his service. Secondly, a warning. Verse 1, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. People shouldn't enter ministry for the wrong motives. Paul addressed the issue of false teachers when he wrote to the Galatians. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, as we've said before. So now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed. Note James says, we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Here he is including himself. He is a teacher and he is applying the text to himself as well. The question asked of this text is, were these teachers James is addressing diligent in handling the word of God accurately? Or were they just tickling people's ears by telling them what they wanted to hear? Well, it would appear from what James writes these men were not preaching the whole counsel of God. They were preaching a neutered gospel, which is no gospel. Being a teacher of God's word is a dangerous occupation because the tongue can speak error. The tongue can launch into uttering words that are inappropriate or misrepresent Christ or the Holy Spirit. Remember, Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. 
But before he began to speak about the things of God, God took him out to the Nabataean area of Arabia and trained him for two years and then brought him back to civilization only when he's able and ready to proclaim the gospel of free grace. We all have to answer for our spoken and written words. Ministers and elders will have the most to answer for. So be careful what you say and what you write. And thirdly, we all stumble. Verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. You know, you can't put toothpaste back into a tube once it's been squeezed out. All people trip up. They trip up in the world, they trip up in secular ways and spiritual ways. And James includes himself as somebody who stumbles. I've seen a great deal of embarrassing stumbling. I've witnessed brides stumble going up or down the aisle. I myself have nearly fallen out of a pulpit going down the stairs simply because they were steep and turned rather tightly. And I really wasn't looking where I was going, to be honest, but, you know, ain't much fun just about breaking your ankle. The human race is a stumbling race, both spiritually and physically. Remember Moses at Meribah Kadesh? He'd been told what to do, but instead he struck the rock and water came forth. He disobeyed God, but he also had the audacity to claim the miracle for himself. And the psalmist referring to that incident says, Moses spoke rashly with his lips. If we're honest, the one thing we find most difficult to control is our speech. Words have a way of slipping off the tongue and out of our lips before we know it. And often this can bring about tragic results, either for ourselves or others or both. These proverbs, a dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. I like this, a fool's lips walks into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. A lying tongue hates its victims and a flattering mouth works ruin. If we could just muzzle our mouth, tame our tongue, everything else would be so simple by comparison. And by using that word bridle, James perhaps is looking back to 1 verse 26, and perhaps he remembered the counsel of David who wrote, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle, so long as the wicked are in my presence. We need to be more spiritually mature in order to control our tongues. It is also the evidence of God's grace at work in our life when we have control of our tongues. And it's also another identity of our Christian maturity. We read this in 1 Peter. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Our Lord's humility and submission is not a sign of weakness. It's a display of power. Jesus could have summoned the armies of heaven to rescue him. 
and his words to Pilate are proof that he was in complete command of the situation. Jesus had committed himself to the Father, and the Father always judges righteously. We are not saved by following Christ's example. As sinners, we need a saviour, not an example. By looking at your tongue, a doctor can tell a great deal about your physical condition. Similarly, we can learn a great deal about a person's spiritual condition by the way they use their tongue. Justin Martyr, early church father and Christian apologist wrote, by examining the tongue of a patient, physicians find out the diseases of the body. Philosophers find out the diseases of the mind. Christians find out the diseases of the soul. This passage is directed to me as it is to you. It's an area in which we all struggle. So in closing, may I suggest that before we utter a word, we should reflect on think. Think as an acrostic. T is for true. Is what I am about to say true? H is for helpful. Is what I am about to say helpful? I is for inspiring. Is what I am about to say inspiring? N is for necessary. Is what I am about to say necessary? K is for kind. Is what I'm about to say kind? Think. Easier said than done. But as a Christian living in this world, we should be in control of our tongues at all times. Tradesmen and keen DIY people will often tackle the most difficult task first leaving the easier task for later. For the Christian, the most difficult task that must always be addressed, first and foremost, is control of the tongue. And in order to control our tongue, we must ask God's guidance, ask for his wisdom, ask for his discernment, that we can truly speak well and not ill of people, that we can be servants who humbly serve by proclaiming the gospel of free grace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. These are very, very hard words of James. Lord, let us take on board the lessons, let us reflect, let us read and Meditate on these words and let us truly think, think and think before we speak. Continue with us, we pray, that we would bring you to glory by being humble, obedient servants, always seeking your wisdom so that what we say brings you the glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask these things, and for his sake alone. Amen. Well, my friends, please stay safe, and we'll see, be together next week, all being well. Blessings and bye.